Please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7. Matthew 5, 7. As we continue through the Beatitudes. The uh, 1984 film, The Karate Kid, the bullies who pick on Daniel LaRusso are all members of the Cobra Kai Karate Dojo. And the first time we, we see the dojo, we see emblazoned on the wall, and we hear chanted by the students the, the motto, the slogan, almost the life verse, if you will, of the Cobra Kai Dojo. It's strike first, strike hard, no mercy. And even though we recognize that this is the mindset that makes the Cobra Kai the bad guys, it's the same mindset that has been really adopted by America at large. No mercy. As identity politics grow, more and more people decide that they, or that the group that they identify with, have been wronged by others. And instead of seeking peace and reconciliation, they seek revenge. Under the guise of justice, they seek to oppress those who have previously oppressed them to exact repayment for every single wrong they have suffered. And this anger and rage is tearing our society apart. It, it will lead to our country tearing itself apart in, into warring tribes unless we turn and repent as a country, unless we give heed to the words of our Savior Jesus Christ, especially the words that we find here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And before we uh, consider these words, will you please pray with me? Father, this morning uh, we stand before you as, as the publican, the tax collector, that Jesus mentioned. We have no righteousness of our own to point to. We have no good works to show. We, we have no bargains to make. All we can say is, Lord, be merciful to us sinners. Lord, we pray the same on behalf of our country. We, we can't point to any works that our nation has done that deserves your grace or your mercy. Even as people cry out for justice, we know that justice demands that each and every single one of us die for our sins. We don't deserve your mercy, but we need it. We cry out for it. We ask that you'd be merciful to all those who are consumed by anger and hatred, that you would soften their hearts with the truth of your gospel, that they would see that their longings will only ever be fulfilled in you. We ask for mercy for our, our president and the first lady and, and all those who are currently or, or have been sick with the coronavirus. We ask that they would recover. But Lord, we ask also that this disease would not only not lead to death, but that it would lead them to true repentance and life that being confronted with, with our mortality, with our inability, would lead them to look to you, the author and giver of life. Lord, as, as we seek to know you, as we seek to serve you, as we seek to glorify you, 
still we stand daily in need of, of mercy. We will never earn or deserve your righteousness or your favor. Lord, be merciful to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, our text this morning is Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. This fifth beatitude shares the same form as, as the previous four beatitudes and the beatitudes that follow. Uh, this group of people who share this characteristic are blessed because they receive this particular blessing. Uh, those who are poor in spirit will receive the kingdom of God. Those who mourn will be comforted. Those who are meek will inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied. And the merciful shall receive mercy. That the blessing for the merciful is mercy. Mercy is an attribute of God. In, in Exodus chapter 34, verse 8, God declares himself to be Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious. Mercy is, is related to kindness, it's related to forgiveness, it's, it's related to grace. It's, it especially has in view the misery that's caused by sin, and it seeks to relieve that misery. It, it does not operate out of duty or necessity or justice. It isn't driven by what people deserve. It's driven by compassion. And in this sense, mercy actually stands in tension with justice. Justice demands that people receive what they deserve for good or for ill. But mercy forgives and alleviates the consequences from sin and, and wrongdoing. And again, we see that tension expressed in Exodus 34, where after the Lord proclaims himself to be merciful and gracious, he, he continues, he is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving transgression and iniquity and sin. But who will by no means clear the guilty. And how can God forgive iniquity and not clear the guilty? How can God be merciful to sinners without denying justice? Or even as we read in Proverbs 17, 15 this morning, he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous is alike an abomination to the Lord. And yet our only hope is that God would justify the wicked because we are wicked. Justice demands that sinners get what they deserve, which is eternal death separated from God. But mercy offers forgiveness and life. Before we, we consider how God can be both merciful and just, and we need to make another point clear. That's justice demands the death penalty for all of us. Across the country, as protesters and rioters shout, no justice, no peace, they, they, they're complaining about various court decisions that they don't, they don't like. But these protesters don't understand justice, and they don't really want justice. Because justice would demand their deaths. Hear, hear the words of Romans chapter 1, verses 29 to 32, speaking of those who do not see fit to acknowledge God. Paul writes, They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, 
slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Those who do such things deserve to die. The covetous, the envious, the strifeful, the haters of God, the inventors of evil. Everyone is guilty of one or more of these sins. And as, as James chapter 2 tells us, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. Or as Romans 3.23 puts it, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Justice demands our deaths. We deserve to die. And until, until you are willing to accept this truth, that you are a sinner, that you deserve death and hell, then you will remain forever cold and closed to God's mercy. That so many people don't care about mercy because they don't think they need mercy. They think they deserve only good things because they're ignorant of God and of themselves. But if we are all sinners, if we all deserve to die, then how can God have mercy on us? How, how is that not a miscarriage of justice? It would be unjust if it wasn't for the work of Jesus Christ. Romans 3 continues, verses 24 through 26, after saying all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because of his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that God might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God's justice demands that we be punished with death. God's mercy delivers us from that death. God satisfies both through Jesus Christ, because Jesus is the true God, He's the true man, and He is willing and able to be the propitiation for our sins. He can remove the Father's wrath and restore His favor to us. He, he does this by taking our sins upon Himself and suffering the penalty for our sins. He dies in our place. He pays our debt. And both justice and mercy are satisfied. Justice is satisfied because the death that is demanded has been given. The penalty is paid in full. But mercy is satisfied because it is Jesus who pays our debt on our behalf. Because Jesus suffered what we deserved, we can receive the mercy of God. We can be delivered from our bondage to sin. We can be delivered from the death and misery that, that our sins deserve, from our separation from God, from our hostility towards one another. Life and joy and peace and fellowship with God can all be ours, not because we deserve any of these things, but because God and His compassion and His mercy freely gives them to us. Our hope is not in justice. It's, it's not in one day we'll get what we deserve. Our hope is in the mercy of God. We all desperately need this mercy 
Without it, we, we will not receive any of these blessings mentioned in the Beatitudes. Without mercy, we will not receive the kingdom of heaven. Without it, we will not receive God's comfort. Without it, we will not inherit the earth. Without mercy, we will not be satisfied with righteousness. Without mercy, we will not see God. Without mercy, we will not be called sons of God. Every, every good thing that we receive is only received through the mercy of God. Because we need God's mercy, therefore we must be merciful. This is, this is not to say that we earn God's mercy by being merciful. Okay, that, that misses the entire concept of mercy. It's not earned. It's not deserved. Anything that you deserve is justice, not mercy. But as we accept the mercy of God, we are so moved, we are so transformed by the power of that mercy, by the work of the Holy Spirit, that we must be merciful to others. We receive God's mercy through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And then if we are repentant, if we trust Jesus, if we trust His Word, if we recognize our need for mercy, then we will be merciful to others. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones expressed it like this, I am only truly forgiven when I am truly repentant. To be truly repentant means that I realize I deserve nothing but punishment, and that if I am forgiven, it is to be attributed entirely to the love of God, and to His mercy and grace, and to nothing else at all. But I go further, it means this, if I am truly repentant, and realize my position before God, and realize that I am only forgiven in that way, then out of necessity I shall forgive those who trespass against me. And Jesus taught this again and, and again. In the Lord's Prayer, in Matthew chapter 6, as He taught His disciples to pray, the second to last line is, And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. You could translate it, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And then, as Jesus ends the prayer, that's the one line that, that He gives further explanation to. He says, in verses 14 and 15, Matthew 6. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Or, or again in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Jesus tells the parable of a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And as he's going through his servants, he comes upon one who owes him 10,000 talents. A talent is a unit worth about 20 years' labor. So 10,000 talents take 200,000 years for one person to pay off by their labor. This servant had, had no means to repay this debt. I, I can't even fathom what he did to get himself 10,000 talents into debt in the first place. And so the king is going to sell the man and his family and all of his possessions to pay off some small portion of the debt because the man is not worth nearly that much. And the servant implores the king for patience. He says, be patient with me, and I will repay it. How? We, he, he can't repay it. But he's desperate. And the king is moved with pity and compassion, and has mercy on his servant, and is not only patient with him, but forgives the debt. And that same servant shortly afterwards found another servant who owed him a hundred 
denarii. A denarii is what a laborer would earn in one day. So we have a little over three months worth of, of wages here. Still a, a substantial sum, but nothing approachable to 10,000 talents. And the man seizes his debtor and begins to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. And the servant, the other servant, says, be patient with me and I will repay. He says exactly what the first servant said. The difference is he had a debt that was actually repayable. But the servant, the first servant, refuses to be patient. He throws the other servant into prison. And when the king heard what had happened, he was angry. He summoned the first servant and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And the master delivered him over to the jailer until he should pay all his debt. And Jesus concluded the parable with, with these words. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Jesus could not be more clear. That the pity, the mercy, the compassion... The forgiveness of God precedes our forgiveness towards others. But as, as James 2.13 says, judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. But mercy triumphs over judgment. The merciful and only the merciful receive the mercy of God. God's mercy isn't a result of your mercy. But if you will not be merciful, then you are rejecting God's mercy. You are forfeiting His grace. If you desire the mercy of God, if you're trusting in the mercy of God, then you must be merciful. To be a Christian is to be merciful. And every one of our relationships regularly provides opportunities for mercy. If, if you're married, your, your spouse, with frequency, fails you. He, he doesn't do something that you'd asked him to do. She does something that you asked her not to do. He, he, he disappoints you. She disrespects you. There, there's constant... That you're married to a sinner. If you have siblings, your siblings will take and break things that belong to you and they won't even have the courtesy to tell you about it. They'll do something and then they'll try to blame it on you. It's his fault. If your children won't appreciate you. They'll grumble and complain at every effort you make. To seek their good, to raise them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Your co-workers will, will look at your work ethic and decide that, hey, this is a great opportunity to just shift more work onto him. And the only thing that they'll work at is trying to take credit for the work that you do. We, we could multiply examples forever of the ways we sin against each other. The ways we are sinned against, particularly in this context. And our natural response to, to all these things is start looking for ways to get even, to, to get back at them. We might justify it to ourselves by saying, well, they deserve it. They sinned against me first. They started it. Maybe, maybe we'll say, that, well, they need to know what it feels like to be mistreated the way I'm being mistreated. But that's, that's earthly and fleshly and, and, and sinful thinking. God calls us to mercy. God calls us to forgive, not seven times, but 70 times seven times. As our Father has forgiven us. If your brother sins against you seven times in one day, and seven times comes to you saying, I repent, then you are to forgive Being merciful goes, goes beyond just, just forgiveness. Again, it, it's seeking t 
to relieve the misery of others in their suffering. Even, even when they brought it upon themselves. We, we should never say, well, you made your bed, now lie in it. It, it could be completely true that the suffering they're experiencing is entirely the result of their sinful and foolish choices. But all, this, all the suffering that we experience as, as humans is a result of our collective sinful, foolish choices, starting with Adam and even their rebellion against God. And that rebellion has continued to this day. And God hasn't abandoned us to ourselves and the consequences of our actions. In mercy, He sent His Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting So will you give of your time and energy and resources to help people who are suffering, even, even when it's their own fault? Will you seek to help them to live better, to, to better care for what God has entrusted to them, to make better use of what they have? This is being merciful to those around you. Being merciful has real world costs. It, it's not just a mindset. It requires sacrifices. It, it might cost you money. It will certainly cost you time and energy. It will frequently lead to people taking advantage of you. But the blessing is far more than worth the cost. Even in this life, it, it will lead to better, deeper, richer relationships with, within the church and within your family. Lead to better friendships with your neighbors and within your communities. And, and even when it doesn't, every loss you suffer for mercy's sake will be more than repaid to you from the riches of God's grace. He has rescued you from your sin and your misery. Through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He has forgiven you, Christian, all your trespasses. He adopts you as sons. He makes you heirs of heaven with Christ. He showered mercy upon you beyond your wildest imagination. And so let us also show mercy to others. But if, if you're here today and, and your conscience convicts you, if you have not been merciful, if you have no desire to be merciful, then, then be warned. If you are clinging to your grudges, to your hard-hearted refusal to forgive or care for others, then God will not forgive you. But even now, if you repent of your sins, including your hard-heartedness, if you turn to Jesus in repentance and faith, then you will receive mercy. Duncan Campbell was a Scottish preacher in the first half of the 20th century. Northern Scotland especially. He's described a period of time in the 1940s, shortly after World War II, um, when he was preaching in the Scottish Hebrides, the, the island chain north of, of Scotland, particularly on the Isle of, of Lewis. And the Spirit of God was working powerfully on, on that island within the church, among the, the community. And, and, and Campbell describes how uh, while he was, was preaching there, men and, and women would come regularly to the church uh, just asking again and again, is there mercy for me? Is there mercy for me? The answer to that question is always yes. There is mercy for all those who ask for it. And that truth should move our hearts to, to unending joy. I don't deserve mercy. 
but there is mercy for me. But if, if you're unconcerned or unmoved by God's promise of mercy, then, then the most loving and merciful thing that I can do for you this morning is to tell you to be afraid. If you think that you don't need God's mercy, if you think you'll be fine without it, if you think you have no need to be merciful to others, then, then you are so nearsighted that you are blind. You don't understand your sin. You don't understand the righteousness or the justice of God. Return to your Bible. Consider the truth about God. Consider the truth about man. Consider the truth about yourself. No one who honestly considers themselves can say that I don't need the mercy of God. Any amount of honesty and integrity will compel you to turn to God for His mercy. You stand in desperate need of mercy, and there is mercy for you. And that mercy will make you merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. You pray with me. Father, we are guilty so often of not showing mercy, of insisting that we are in the right and that our demands for justice will be satisfied even while we, we dare to claim your mercy. Lord, help us to see the enormity of the, the debt of sin that has been forgiven in your Son. Let us see how small these transgressions against us have been in comparison. Lord, we know that the people around us don't deserve mercy. But let us never forget that we don't deserve mercy either. Make us merciful because you are merciful. Make us merciful because Jesus is merciful. And we are being conformed to his image. Let us be merciful so that we might show lost and dying, hell-deserving sinners the love and the mercy that you have lavished upon us in the gospel, that they might come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Lord, we, we have no hope as individuals outside of your mercy. We have no hope as a church outside of your mercy. We have no hope as a country outside of your mercy. Lord, be merciful to us sinners. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.